Psalm 23 The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord with all my heart as I meet with his people. How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them. Everything he does reveals his glory and majesty. His righteousness never fails. He causes us to remember his wonderful works. How gracious and merciful is our Lord. He gives food to those who fear him. He always remembers his covenant. He has shown his great power to his people by giving them the lands of other nations. All he does is just and good, and all his commandments are trustworthy. They are forever true, to be obeyed faithfully and with integrity. He has paid a full ransom for his people. He has guaranteed his covenant with them forever. What a holy, awesome, inspiring name he has. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom. Praise him forever. Father, I come to you today with joy and with sadness. Joyful because you continue to enrich our lives and let us love each other even though we're spaced out and from a distance. Sad because I miss my brothers and sisters at Vandalia. Father, I pray that you give us wisdom on the types of gatherings that we should have moving forward. That you give us wisdom in this discernment process with the shepherds. And that you continue to guide us and allow us to feel the brothers and sisters that we have in Christ, even though we don't get to see each other every week. I pray that this vaccine continues to spread throughout the cities and that it becomes more widely available. I pray that your hand is on those that are hurting or sick or that are suffering from this illness. God, we thank you for the blessings that you continue to place in our life, especially those that come from unexpected places. Thank you for providing hope and thank you for never letting us lose our joy as long as we continue to trust in you. Your son's holy name, amen. Good morning. Early last year, based on recommendations from the RNR committee, we started the process of selecting additional shepherds for Vandalia. In March, we began by compiling scriptures that describe the characteristics of shepherds and asked the congregation to consider these traits and ask themselves, who comes to mind at Vandalia that is already exhibiting these attributes? You may remember the Sunday we planned to initially present this was March 15th, the beginning of our meeting at a distance. Nevertheless, we communicated electronically to begin the process. In April, we postponed the recommendations to a later time when we would be meeting again, at least we anticipated meeting again. In August, we restarted the process of prayer and recommendations for Vandalia Shepherds. Then in October, we announced a schedule that would include a deadline of December 1st for recommendations. The month of December consisted of prayer about those have submitted and meeting with individuals and their families. 
all this brings us to today. This morning, we want to review some of these passages and conclusions regarding attributes of shepherds. Let's listen to the passages and some of the specific conclusions. And the Apostle Paul wrote these words to his young protege, Timothy. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And he was, must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. And now Paul speaks to his friend Titus and to us. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. And since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and that he can refute those who oppose it. Good morning. These scriptures list one trait or characteristic after another in describing shepherds. Words and phrases that represent a whole lifetime of love, service, and behavior. As I was looking at these verses, it made me think of ceremonies that I have attended when a person is being honored. It might be an award ceremony, or an inauguration, or even a memorial service. In those times, a speaker will often start by choosing only one or two words to describe the person's life. For example, Someone could say, when I think of Carl, I think of short, bald, beard. And hopefully, they would throw in some other things that are deeper than my appearance. Well, when the writer Paul wrote these verses to Timothy and Titus, he couldn't contain himself to one or two words in describing shepherds. He used many, word after word, phrase after phrase, comma after comma. And it works. Thousands of years later, when we read these verses, we get a picture of godly shepherds. We think of people who are above reproach, respectable, honorable, someone who is well respected by people outside the congregation, free from hypocrisy, one who leads by example, a person who has a well-ordered household, a devoted spouse if they're married, someone who is self-controlled, free from excesses, free from addictions. We think of the word wise, a person who makes well-balanced judgments based on scriptural principles, someone who is fair, impartial, desiring the will of God in every decision self-controlled in difficult situations, not quick-tempered, not given to quarreling, 
This person is not power hungry. They won't abuse authority. They are not one who will force their opinions on others. We see the word hospitable and we think of someone who is unselfish, generous, and not stingy or greedy. This person is a devoted Christ follower, not a new believer, someone who is able to communicate truth and sound doctrine, a person of prayer, worship, a student of scripture, stable in faith, obedient to the word of God, continually seeking to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. This is quite a list, and it's fitting. We want people like this to be our shepherds. Vandalia, listen to these words from Ezekiel, the, the prophet, concerning shepherds. The word of the Lord came to me. Mortal, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Ah, ye shepherds of Israel who've been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? <laughs> Do you eat the fat? You clothe yourselves with the wool? You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. You've not strengthened the weak. You've not healed the sick. You've not bound up the injured. You've not brought back the strayed. You've not sought the lost, but with force and harshness, you have ruled them. And so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with no one to search or seek for them. Good morning. I'm going to be kind of refreshing our memory on the passage from Ezekiel relating to the shepherds of Israel. As I'm sure you've all noticed from having just heard it, the passage from the 34th chapter of Ezekiel is a strongly worded condemnation and critique of bad shepherds, shepherds who failed to live up to their calling and proper role. But by painting this negative picture, a picture of what a shepherd is not supposed to be, this passage also helps us to think about what a shepherd should be. So today we return to this passage in order to kind of refresh our, our memory of this. So thinking about the passage in that light as a way of highlighting actually what a shepherd should be, the first thing that comes to mind, the overarching message, is that good shepherds would have been caring and gentle. They would be self-sacrificing. They provide internal support and external protection in that passage. They search for the lost. They bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. There are some important general traits there that transcend time and place. In other words, this is a, these are characteristics of shepherds, good shepherds, in any place, in any time, any era. Likewise, with the passages from the pastoral letters in the New Testament, they seem to have some general characteristics uh, which apply to elders anywhere, but those passages also were somewhat tailored to the specific needs of particular congregations in the first century, which is also something we have to keep in mind when we're reading these passages. From those letters, some of the overarching values and virtues um, by which I mean ongoing tendencies and character traits or habits of the heart, are honorableness, wisdom, faithfulness, honesty, a lack of self-centeredness, self-sacrifice, a tendency to care for the congregation, gentleness rather than quarrelsomeness, sound in faith, love, and endurance. In some, 
we find some common themes highlighted in various ways in these texts, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you might say that binding all these passages together is an image of shepherds or elders as gentle, loving, wise, servant-hearted caretakers. Uh, these are attributes that it's important for all of us to keep in mind as we at Vandalia continue to reflect on precisely these questions and identify specific people to take these roles among us. And now Peter speaks to us. Now, as an elder myself, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that is in your charge, exercising the oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you do it. Not for sordid shame, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you must clothe yourselves with humility in your dealings with one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I love this passage from Peter. Peter, who walked on water to Jesus, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Peter, who cut off the ear of a soldier to defend his teacher, and only a few hours later was weeping bitterly because he had denied Jesus three times. And Peter, who was asked three times by the risen Christ, Peter, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And now as Peter writes this letter, he is older and wiser because of a lifetime of following Christ. But Jesus' words are still ringing in his ears as he writes, and now, to, as an elder myself and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, I exhort the elders among you to tend the flock of God that is in your charge. Tend the flock. Be diligent. Pay attention. Always be concerned. Don't ignore the sheep. Be willing, not under compulsion, but willingly out of love for Christ. Exercise oversight. There is an administrative piece to eldership, but it must always be in context of what is best for the sheep. And be humble servants. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And don't you imagine Peter was remembering Jesus' washing his feet as he wrote this. And listen to the chief shepherd. Many of you have heard me talk about uh, Jay Rogers before, who was a shepherd to me during a difficult time in my life. And Jay always referred to himself as the under-shepherd because of this passage. Christ is the chief shepherd who will appear. And so the elders are listening to Christ as the under-shepherds to the good shepherd. And we know from John that the good shepherd is a shepherd to all of the sheep, and the sheep know his voice, John 10, 4. But elders especially must always be striving to listen to what Christ and his Spirit are saying. As you have prayed about those who have been exhibiting these characteristics, a number of names have been submitted for consideration. The process has resulted in four individuals standing out among those being recommended. We've had discussions and prayed with these individuals and their families and have reached the point where we want you to join us in prayer over those called to be shepherds. During the next few days, we expect to send you more details in the mail. Please continue in prayer over this whole process. Good morning. As we get ready to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning, I'm going to read to you some familiar verses from Matthew and then share a few thoughts from some things I've read recently. So Matthew chapter 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. 
This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now in these verses, Jesus said about the bread, This is my body given for you. We could think of the bread, Jesus' body, as being about sacrifice. Jesus, in his earthly body, lived and died for others. When we take the bread, we can remember our commitment to live a sacrificial life. And then Jesus said about the wine, This is my blood shed for you. In Leviticus, we learn that the life of a thing is in the blood. When we drink the wine, we could remember the life of Jesus, a life committed to serving God by serving others. As we participate today in this Lord's Supper, let's remember Jesus' sacrificial life as an example, and let us recommit to ourselves and to each other our desire to be God's hands and feet here on earth.